Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I've been asked today to talk about integrated land use in the Cairngorm National Park, and I've also been asked to uh, tell you how, how I got to where I am now. Uh, I manage my family's land holding in the Alvey and Dalradi estates. I'm the fourth generation of my family to manage this land holding. Uh, my qualifications for managing this holding is fif over 50 years experience of practical experience on it and also a PhD in forestry management. Uh, I'm the most overqualified forest uh, firewood merchant in Bedno. Um, Alvin Dalradi Estates extends from the River Spey up into the Monalia Hills across the River Dalnan, which I understand you were studying yesterday, and as far as the watershed into the upper Findhorn. It's entirely within the water catchment area of the River Spey. In terms of size, Alvey and Dalradi Estates is considered a medium-sized holding. The less productive the land, the larger the land holding has to be from which to make a living. The estate extends from ploughable farmland to high moorland. Farming is still an important part of our business. 6% um, of the land is an in by farmland supporting a herd of suckla cattle plus sheep flock. Our cattle are mainly crossbred between traditional hardy native breeds like the shorthorn and normally quicker growing continental breeds like the limousine. Recently we diversified into pedigree beef shorthorns which are mainly sold for breeding. The sheep are mainly blackface but there are also 155 crossbred or mule ewes the blackface ewes are put to either blackface or uh, blueface lester tups, with the cross ewes being put to beltex cross or texel tups. This allows replacement blackface ewe lambs to be homebred and crossbred lambs sold for feeding or fat. Most blackface ewe lambs are bred kept for breeding, the rejects sold fat or store. Approximately 500 blackface ewes are with single lambs and blackface hogs are put to the hill every summer. They're treated every six weeks with Dysect or Crovect to reduce tick infestations, which kill grouse and spread louping ill and Lyme's disease. Farm crops include silage and hay grown for winter feed, rape grown to fatten sheep and cattle, uh, turnips to feed them through the winter. Uh, now, Badenoch means the drowned land in Gaelic. The bottom of the strath is relatively flat and sub subsequently subject to flooding. Flooding deposits nutrients on land adjoining the river Spey and its tributaries. This makes the alluvial land alongside the rivers known as the Hochland, the most productive land in Badenoch. This is an oblique view of the river Feshi where we farm and its confluence with the river Spey. The river at Invereshi is confined between flood banks, which allows the river to maintain its velocity and carry carrying capacity, flushing gravel down into the river Spey and beyond, whilst protecting the surrounding farmland and woodland. Further upriver, there are no flood banks. Channel changes are frequent and makes farming difficult. In flood events, Sediment lo loads are high. It is claimed that around 20,000 tonnes of materials flush down this river annually. 15% of the property is under woodland. The trees have been primarily grown for timber production, although they are also valuable for livestock shelter and recreation. The woodland was originally fenced and planted between 1866 and 1877. The species, 80% Scots pine of native origin, 10% European larch, 10% Norway spruce, and a few Douglas fir. Birch, rowan, oak, aspen, and alder has regenerated naturally. Woodland felled has been restocked by fencing, planting, and natural regeneration. Tree establishment is achieved by deer, stock, and rabbit fencing. We learnt 200 years ago that the most cost-effective way of managing crops and livestock close proximity to one another is to fence off one from the other. This is accepted when farming on the low ground, but often causes controversy in the uplands where production is more extensive. Harvesting is now done by contractors. For smaller dimension and lower quality timber, we chip for biofuel. However, nearly 
of the land is hill and open moorland, what is often referred to as Mamba country, more and more a bugger all. <laughs> it is used primarily for grouse shooting and deer stalking. The estate also has 26 houses, four farmsteadings, horticulture producing strawberries and raspberries, a granite quarry producing pink aggregate building and diking stone. It can be seen throughout Aviemore. We've painted the town pink. <laughs> a gravel quarry producing sand, gravel and recycled material. Schist workings producing diking stone. A fish hatchery producing organic brown trout. A sawmill providing the estate with sawn timber. A holiday park providing tourist accommodation and associated facilities. <coughs> Wood chip production for biomass boilers, a shooting lodge providing catered accommodation and functions, a forestry management and contracting service, three telecommunication masts, and various forms of visitor activities. Tourism now provides the estate's main income. We currently provide more visitor beds than we have sheep, so I'm now officially a mixed farmer. <laughs> We're also the only estate locally who sells both fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> we currently provide, employ 19 full-time staff. If we add in tenants and contractors, this would more than double the number of jobs provided by the estate and its activities. We provide more rented accommodation in the Kincraig area than the local authority. We export food in the form of beef, lamb, venison, grouse, strawberries and raspberries. Wood products including wood chips, and saw logs, quarry products, and we hope to provide renewable energy in addition to biomass, and we import tourists. We do not do everything ourselves. Working with other businesses spreads the risk and utilize the expertise, investment, and enthusiasm of others. Where possible, we work as a team. We have a symbiotic relationship with our tenants. Activities such as the fish hatchery, zip wire, quad biking, horse riding, strawberry production, and Ross's garage utilize the expertise and investment of others. Grouse shooting still remains an important part of the Alvey Estates economy, but it is under threat. Regulations are rapidly restricting our ability to manage. Grouse shooting depends on there being a harvestable surplus of grouse after the weather, predators, and disease have taken what they can. Red deer stalking is an important attribute to a mixed sporting estate. Stag stalking attracts relatively high spending visitors to the area. Deer are better converters of protein than sheep or cattle, an indigenous species that is better adapted to our climate. Venison is a lean meat which is in demand. It's a great alternative to horse meat. <laughs> in contrast to sheep and cattle, wild venison production is not subsidized. However, Scotland is no longer able to meet the UK demand for venison. The demand for venison now exceeds our ability to supply. The UK is now importing 29,000 deer carcasses per year to meet our shortfall between supply and demand. We have turned what was a lucrative export market into an import market, adding to our balance of payments deficit. But Alvey is not just about farming, forestry and field sports. We have 26 houses and provide more rented accommodation in the Kincraig area than the local authority and around 25% of the jobs. We also accommodate tourists. Upmarket to accommodation for the TOFs, where we endeavor to make a lot of money out of a few people. <laughs> Downmarket accommodation for the bobble hatch, where we make less money out of a lot of people. And everything in between for the middle classes. <laughs> to be sustainable, it is important to have a diversified portfolio. When the money is, the, when the economy is buoyant and customers are spending, we can make money from catered and self-catering accommodation, touring caravan and tent pitches. They pay on the day. When the economy is in recession, we need to rely on longer term commitments such as static caravans and chalets. Once they buy their static caravan or chalet on our site, they are hopefully locked in for between one and 20 years. In an area where agricultural production is poor, farming tourists can be an attractive option. The already holiday park is located on what used to be open moorland. The topsoil is thin, the pH low, and grass production relatively poor. On this ground, we could only achieve five sheep per acre, and we still have to supplementary feed them over the winter. But 
we can get eight chalets per acre and they pay for the food they eat. The owners don't eat the grass. So I understand some of them smoke it. <laughs> um, farming tourists is the advantage that unlike cattle and sheep, we don't pay to feed them. They pay us. We sell our beef, lamb, venison and strawberries in our holiday park shop. Tourists are willing to pay more for local food and food miles is almost nil. Another advantage of tourists is when they die. <laughs> Although our soil is short of organic matter, when one of our sheep dies, we're not allowed to bury it. We're no longer allowed to bury a cow, horse, sheep, or even a hen. We must pay for the bodies to be taken away to the knackery where they're rendered down with fossil fuels. But we can bury caravan owners, and we don't even need a license. <laughs> the only stipulation is we're not allowed to cull them, and we cannot bury them close to a watercourse. <laughs> we also have to bury them too deep to, to fertilize next year's silage crop. So we need to invest in trees with large tap roots. We're now looking at green burial sites. The Highland Council proposal to increase burial charges has created an opportunity. We can produce native pine coffins in our sawmill and gravestones from our quarry. Now this is a business that can be buoyant even in a recession. <laughs> of course, our marketing strategy may have to be adjusted. Repeat customers are rare, even if our product is good. <laughs> However, we can expect few customer complaints. But farming, also has, farming tourists also has disadvantages. We can supplement the organic matter in our soils by spreading cow and sheep manure on our fields. But when I mentioned to the council that I intended spreading the contents of my holiday park septic tanks on my fields because the price of nitrogen fertilizer had become unaffordable, they said no. However, they did say they would allow me to install an anaerobic digester. It would appear that I can throw the contents of my septic tank plus other organic matter into a container where air is excluded and take methane off the top. I can then sell this gas back to my caravan owners instead of butane, butane or propane for cooking. If I sell them food from the estate at one end and sell them back gas generated in their own waste at the other, I will have exploited my tourists at both ends. <laughs> Even better, the byproduct is nitrogen rich organic fertilizer I can put on my fields. Now this is both sustainable tourism and integrated land planning. <coughs> We've also invested in biomass for heating. We chip our own wood to heat our catered accommodation in Alvey House and our holiday park toilet block. Dalradi Holiday Park now has the warmest toilet seats in the Cairngorms National <laughs> Park. We also supply schools, offices and large houses. We're the main suppliers of wood chips for biomass and bedno. The oil tankers can no longer compete. I'm known as the wood chip baron of Aidenor. <laughs> our customers also consume electricity. We installed our own hydro scheme in 1908, which produced 15 kilowatts of direct current electricity. Every time a log went through our sawmill, all the lights in the estate went dim. We abandoned the scheme around 1962, when we were able to connect to the national ele electricity <coughs> grid. But with rising electricity prices and the incentive of feed-in tariffs, all is forgiven. We are now in the process of refurbishing our hydro scheme and we've installed solar panels in some of our commercial buildings. However, in order for us to be sustainable in tourism, there is one vital ingredient, tourists. How do we continue to attract them even in a recession? To attract tourists, we first need good access. Before the railways, we had no tourists. <coughs> Ease of access is important. The next important ingredient <coughs> is recreational opportunities. We found that very few tourists just come for a pretty landscape. They come to do, see, or learn something. If they just want to see a pretty view, they can go to the pictures. So we have invested in grouse shooting, deer stalking, fishing, downhill skiing, <laughs> gliding, horse riding, mountain biking, orienteering, play pigeon shooting, archery, four-wheel drive training, quad biking, falconry, challenge games, corporate entertainment, paintball games, gorge walking, motorbike trials, a zip wire course, wildlife photography, survival courses, educational open days, and estate tours. It's important that we attract visitors not just in summer, when the weather is good, but also at other times of year when the weather may be more challenging. So how do we accommodate all these tourists? The more tourists, the more sustainable my tourism business. But there can also be conflicts. 
Tourists can conflict with other estate activities. Disturbance to wildlife and damage done to the environment can be proportional to the number of people we put through it. We have learnt that not all tourists are an economic asset to the estate. Grouse shooters and deer stalkers are worth up to a hundred times the value to the estate per visitor day compared with campers on our campsite. Visitors who utilise our facilities we provide but do not pay end up being a liability. So we now discourage many non-motorised activities such as mountain biking and we are concentrating on those activities that generate the most revenue per visitor day. If we end up with too, mu too much livestock, we can sell or cull them. But culling a surplus of tourists is currently against the law. <laughs> However, the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 has come to our rescue. The secret is to persuade tourists to camp on my campsite and recreate on my neighbour's ground. <laughs> now I just have irate neighbours. <laughs> <laughs> Tourists on the farm can compromise the biosecurity of our livestock. Some of our livestock are incompatible with visitors. The Scottish Outdoor Access Code means we are no longer allowed to put up notices discouraging access. So we have to be more subtle. Our woodlands are perhaps more compatible with tourism. We grow our trees for timber production and livestock shelter. Whilst tourists use our woods for recreation, defecation, fornication and dumping their rubbish. But there can also be a symbiotic relationship. The further away our tourists camp from our toilet block, the more they fertilize my trees. <laughs> Woodlands are also an important factor in providing a sense of seclusion, um, exclusivity and wildness. If we have a parish outing and a courting couple in 10 acres of open beach or moorland, neither are happy. But if you put them in 10 acres of woodland, woodland both parties can be satisfied. So what about the future? Our ability to manage visitors is being eroded. If we replace field sports with campers, we will need to increase our visitor numbers by a hundred times to generate the same gross income. This will damage our environment and compromise the seclusion, exclusivity, wildlife and wilderness experience <coughs> that so many visitors expect and enjoy. But demographics are in our favour. There is predicted to be a huge rise in pensioners over the next two decades. Over the next 17 years, the number of residents <coughs> in the Highlands over 75 years of age is predicted to double. Pensioners are the growth market of the immediate future. Many pensioners have disposable income. <laughs> they have money to spend. Changes to legislation means they can now cash in their pensions. No more annuities. So we're looking at farming pensioners. <laughs> that, of course, assumes they will retire before they die. <laughs> If we can have a chalet park of pensioners with a shop selling state produce at one end, our green burial site at the other, and an anaerobic digester and a hydro scheme to provide their energy need requirements, and our target market of customers is growing, this could be a good, sustainable and growing business for the future. The future of farming, forestry and field sports is more uncertain. If we wish to expand timber production in the medium term, we are already too late. Trees planted for timber production this year will not be ready to harvest before 2044 at the earliest. The world's population, along with the demand for food, is increasing. But Scotland's food production is actually decreasing. The UK is now becoming less self-sufficient in the food we can produce. But what we can be is more self-sufficient and efficient in growing in providing renewable energy. That, of course, is providing we can obtain planning consent. The, global, the prospect of global warming could be both a threat and an opportunity. <coughs> With reducing snow cover, we could lose skiing in the Cairngorms within the next 20 years. If the ice in the Arctic melts, the seas around us will rise. It could actually bring the seaside to Vaidnoch. On the other hand, global warming could be so intense that Vaidnoch could be turned into a desert. This could present us with more of a challenge. <laughs> With a nation's borrowing and balance of payments deficit growing ever larger, our best chance of survival is becoming as self-sufficient as we can and keeping the economy of our state diversified. Thank you.